title of the message tonight is Ministry Niches, or Niches, or Nietzsche's, or whatever you pronounce that. How do you all say that? I say niche. All, all in favor for niche? Okay, niches have it. <laughs> I'm probably going to say niche anyway. Ministry Niches, okay? So some of you might be like, what is a niche? I don't, under, I don't understand. Well, a, a niche is, okay, like think about like you have a restaurant, you know, that net restaurant is catering towards a specific group of people, you know what I mean, that, to, that they're going to draw in. And everybody does that. Everybody has a group that they're marketing to, and there's something, you know, specific about what they offer that's going to hit a certain group. And that's really important that a, that a person finds their niche in the business world because uh, we'll get into that in this in this sermon, but because that's going to actually get you your customers because you actually know who those customers are, okay? And I hate talking business and customers and all that stuff uh, in relating it to church because I realize we're not in the biz that kind of a business. It is the Father's business, and so we, there's some biblical principles that we have to follow that. Uh, but I got to thinking about this idea, and uh, and you know, in the Bible, halfway through the book of Acts, it takes that long, but halfway through the book of Acts, like we finally see the gospel being spread and they're going into the world, which is what Jesus uh, initially wanted them to do. Like he wanted them to go into the whole world, preach the gospel. We even find in the Old Testament, you're going to be a light to the Gentiles. I mean, uh, there's a lot of evidence that that was God's plan from the very beginning, right? There's people that that disagree with that, but I think it's pretty clear in the Bible that was the the ultimate plan from the very beginning, even to the promise to Abraham that you'd be a blessing to the whole world, right? And so the seed of Abraham, as those spiritual seed, those who trust in Christ, it was the plan from the beginning. And so, uh, uh, so halfway through we see that, and of course uh, there are some clicks. You know, and we'll talk about this a little bit, but you got some, the Jews sticking together and the Greeks sticking together. That's normal, human nature. You know, we, we have little cliques here and there. In any church, there's going to be some cliques based on interest and different things that people do, different walks, uh, uh, areas of life, you know, that they're in. And, and uh, there will be that. But ultimately, churches today, uh, they should be, and I believe a lot of them are, uh, you know, just very diverse, you know, and I don't mean necessarily color, although that would that would be diversity that is welcomed, and and you know it shouldn't it shouldn't always be. Although sometimes it is, and it's not necessarily wrong that this church is a black church primarily, or this is a is a all white church. Like it's not like you put a sign up and said no uh, other races allowed or something like that, right? But ultimately, in an ideal situation, we would have all kinds of diverse people groups and different interests and these people like these different things, right? Because we're preaching the gospel to the whole world. We don't go into one neighborhood and, and ask them, you know, hey, do you like to do the, you know, do you like lasagna? And if they say no, 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 I got a better one. Do you like drinking coffee? And if they say no, we don't like coffee, but oh, I'm gonna go to the next house, <laughs> right? No. So, so, you know, ultimately you're gonna have some various because we're preaching the gospel to everybody and we're inviting everybody to get saved to come be a part of the church and get discipled and be a part of that. Okay. However, when I read in the Bible, it seems interesting to me. Here's some things that kind of jumped out at, at me that number one, when Jesus goes out and he gathers his disciples, right away, we see him grab two fishermen, right? Four fishermen, actually. Two groups of fishermen, two brothers, two, two uh, uh, groups of brothers who were working together. The Bible says they're partners, okay? So we got Andrew and Simon or Peter, and then we got James and John, sons of Zebedee. And he reaches, these are the first four that he picks as his disciples, and, you know, there's, uh, you could wonder, like, why is that? I don't know. I mean, there's obviously some really good uh, examples and some illustrations in regards to fish and fishing. And, of course, the famous, I'll make you fishers of men. And, uh, and so what a great illustration. I don't know that he necessarily thought, hey, I need to go find some fishermen so I can use this great illustration. <laughs> I don't think it was like that. But he did go directly to these fishermen, and uh, he began his ministry with them. It seems kind of interesting to me, but there's some things you could think about that. Of course, he comes back later on in his ministry, uh, in, in Peter's ministry. Look at, look at John 21. 
Now, similar to what we just read in Luke 5, and I could have went to different gospel accounts, but I just uh, picked Luke 5, and I was looking at them, and I, and I looked at the end, and I, this one I really liked. I'm going to kind of get off my message here for a minute to show you something that I, I noticed that really stuck out uh, to me as I was reading this. Uh, John chapter 21 says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, this is after, the resurre after his resurrection. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas... Uh, called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others uh, of the, his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. Now he's telling them how he revealed himself to them. So, you know, he's going to reveal himself to them in this story. But right now he hasn't revealed himself. So they're just sitting around and, and uh, Peter, you know, who left the fishing career and he said, hey, Peter, don't worry, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then he followed Jesus and became fishers of men. And now he's going back and he says, I go a fishing. And look what it says. Uh, uh, he says, I go a fishing. And they say unto him, we also go with thee. So all those disciples sitting around said, hey, we're going to go with you. Now, I don't know. Maybe more of the disciples were fishermen. Then we think we we know for sure four of them were fishermen. Uh, maybe others had a, a little bit of a, a hand in that trade as well, uh, or maybe they just wanted to follow him because you know who doesn't like fishing. But anyway, uh, so it says that they they went there and um, and and they fished and and they went all night long. It says they uh, went forth and entered into the ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. You ever been fishing? You know what that's like. If you ever been fishing with me, you know what that's like. Fishing all night, not catching anything, right? In this case, it seems clear that this was a great illustration what Jesus was using to show them, hey, you went after, you know, just like he did when he started his ministry, like we read in Luke 5. Uh, you know, he's going to show him how he's going to catch all these fish, multitudes of fish. And he said, you know, hey, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And so now here we go. He's following up. They can't catch any fish. And it says, but when the morning was come, verse 4, morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, children, have ye any meat? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore. I kind of wonder if at this point they started thinking like, whoa, this sounds familiar. Maybe this is. And, uh, and so they did it. And now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, is who he's talking about. Said, Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when P Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat uh, uh, unto him. That means he didn't have any clothes on. Uh, they just took nakedness very seriously but after he uh was in the ship he put his coat on and he girded he tied the belt around it and uh and he jumped in after uh to go after jesus he did cast himself into the sea and the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from the land but as it were 200 cubits dragging the net with fishes now this is the part that i wanted to bring i mean you know this this all is, is applicable but uh, i'm gonna get away from my message here for a minute just to show you this this really stuck out at me all right, and I'll tell you why here in a second. As soon as they were come to land, they saw the fire coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Now, just this week, and you've heard this many times, and I've heard this many times in my life, and just this week, somebody uh, I was talking to, uh, somebody who uh, used to do the same things that we do as far as soul winning, and he got away from that, and uh, I won't get into a whole lot of details on that, but he said to me that it's prideful you know, to like keep track of all the numbers of how many people got saved and all that stuff. And when I was reading this, this thing just popped out at me, and, and I'm like, you know what? Why do you think they knew there was 153 fish that they caught? You know why? Because fishermen count their fish. <laughs> right? You guys went fishing the other day. How many fish did you guys catch, Brother Austin? 30. He knows exactly. And it's not like around 30. He knows 29 of what kind of fish and one of another kind of fish. Because if you're a fisherman, you count your fish, right? And I've always wondered, like in Acts 2, it's like after that message, about 3,000 people were saved. And I'm like, you think they could just look out at a crowd and be like, eh, it looks like about 3,000? No, I think they counted and they said, hey, man, we just saw 3,000 people get saved and get baptized. 
Later on, like 5,000. And I think they just counted, right? Because fishermen count their fish. It's okay. There's nothing prideful about it. You just want to know what the haul was, <laughs> you know? All right, now back to the message. <clears throat> All right, so this fishing thing, you know, maybe there was just a great illustration that Jesus wanted to teach them through this. Who knows? We know in Mark 6, you don't have to go there, but Mark 6, 1 through 3, if you want to look it up, Jesus was a carpenter. Okay, now we know his, we know Joseph, I almost said his dad. That wouldn't be correct. Joseph was a carpenter, all right? But the Bible specifically says, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Joseph? And so, so like, like Jesus was in that trade. He followed Joseph's trade and he was, was a carpenter. But you don't see him with just a whole bunch of his carpenter buddies like starting this work, you know, this, this new religion or something like that with his carpenter buddies. I don't know what the deal was, but he went and he somehow landed with the fishermen. Maybe he knew them, you know, from different ways. I don't know. He was 30 years old. Uh, whenever he began his ministry. So maybe he had come in contact with some of these guys. I don't know the whole story, but, uh, but that's, that's who he started with. Okay. And then after the, the 12 disciples are gathered and then, you know, he's got other followers. Of course, there's another 70 that he sends out uh, soul winning as well. Uh, but what does he tell them? Look at, look at Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and, the manner of, and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles uh, are these, the first Simon who is called Peter and Andrew his brother, James, and, uh, uh, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, uh, Thomas, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Labius, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas the Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now we know that, like I said, I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus is, is his his idea was, his mindset, his goal was always to reach the whole world. All right, that was clear. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And, and whosoever, it doesn't matter who they are, we understand that. In fact, he, we even see at the beginning of Acts, you know, he says, you know, you, you'll be witnesses of me in both Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the, and, and, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Like he, he, he wanted them to go into the whole world. But when Jesus first started sending people out, he said, you know what, just go to the lost sheep of Israel. You know, this is why you saw them. They go to the synagogues and they go to the places where the Jews hung out and they would begin to preach them. Hey, you should know this. The Bible, the, old, the, the scripture that they had, you know, prophesied that the Messiah was coming. John the Baptist said, hey, this is the Messiah. And they're going and they're preaching that. We, we know the Messiah. We, you know, you've seen and heard about all the miracles he's doing. He's, he showed himself to be. They went to the lost children of Israel who should know that he was the Messiah. And so, like, if you think about why, now, I don't know exactly why he chose the fishermen, you know, that, that niche, if you will, but we, it's pretty obvious why he chose to start with the Jews because that would have been the easiest people group to, to reach. And we can see in the Bible a lot of hard, hard, uh, hardened hearts among the Jews and a lot of people that didn't get saved and a lot of Pharisees and scribes. But we also know that he reached a lot of Jews who did get saved. There were a lot of believers who did. I mean, from the very beginning, from his birth on, there were people that came to know that he was the Messiah and they put their trust in him. And that's how he got his, uh, that beginning crew that we see in Acts. Okay. And then from there, it just kind of ended up growing. And then there's lots of different churches that ended up starting in different regions and, uh, and all that. Okay. So, it makes sense to start with groups of people who you're most likely to reach. All right. That's the, that's the ultimate r reason to have a, uh, a niche, right? And when I started, uh, 
it's a long story. I won't get into all the details, but I, I have a YouTube channel, not just the Iola Baptist Temple, but there's another one that I've got more of private, like things that I do outside of uh, the ministry type things, but running and all that kind of stuff. And I remember I was making some YouTube videos and I was thinking, I wonder what I have to do to get more followers. Cause I know that's like the big deal, right? Subscribers. I mean, and so I started like, uh, uh, you know, researching like how to make YouTube videos and how some of these YouTube videos get so big. <laughs> Ultimately, I, I pretty much gave up on trying to get subscribers, okay? <laughs> but here's what I found out. They, one of the big rules was you have to find a niche. You can't just throw a whole bunch of stuff out there. You've got to single it down to this one audience of people who are going to look up that, uh, that you know, thing that you're doing and be interested in that and want to watch that. Otherwise, it's not going to hit any audience, okay? So I'm going to talk to you just, uh, uh, just two things. The positives about niche ministries and the negatives or the idea of, of about having a, a, a ministry niche. Okay. And so <clears throat> positive, first of all, is this makes sense. Having a niche hits a specific target. Okay. Now I'm going to illustrate that. I asked my helpers here, uh, brother, uh, Isaac and, and Natalia. Yeah. Brother Isaac and miss Natalia. Uh, they're going to come up and, uh, Dad's going to blindfold them, make sure they can't cheat. They can't see. Come on up here, guys. And once they get that blindfold on them real good, and we know they can't see, Zach, uh, Braden's got a, a job to do as well. <coughs> and so without looking... Braden is going to hang some targets, okay, in the room. You don't need to know where they are. Just know that in this room, there are going to be some targets. And then I'm going to give you some ammo. And I'll put it in your hand, okay? So you get just so you to make it fair disorient disorient yourselves a little bit why don't you uh, spin around a little bit no don't get sick or anything but spin around a little bit and then stop whenever you're ready okay stop whenever you're ready okay good all right now I'm gonna give you one and you one all right now you just throw it wherever you think the target is. well not yet now hold on he's still uh okay you just throw it wherever you think that target is just throw it Throw it as far or as short as you want. Whoa! <laughs> I thought about I thought about giving them darts. I'll give you three tries. All right, go. Wherever you think a target is. <laughs> All right, one more. One more, go. <laughs> All right, now take the blindfolds off. All right. Yeah, just, just hand them here. All right. There's one. There's one. Now, find the target and see if you can hit it. Good job. Good job. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure that would have hit. Now, here's another thing. I didn't tell you you can't move. You can go wherever you want. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> he had to. He he had to uh, uh, try try to go from a distance. One more. One more. Oh, you already got one. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. I think. I mean, it was a simple illustration, but I think you get the idea. When you when you have a target, right? You're going to hit that target, and. Uh, now, we don't always know who our target is, you know, and so uh, I'm going to explain that here in a minute. But the idea is when you hit, when you know who your target is, you're going to hit it. You know, if you're just throwing randomly, you might hit something, but it's, you know, you might have a lot of dead space and, 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 and not be as productive or effective. Now, I'm going to give you some examples, and I'm not recommending these ministries or these church, these types of churches, okay? I'm going to give you some examples uh, that are out there. I don't necessarily think that they're all bad ideas. I'm just telling you that I'm just, uh, this is just things that exist. Okay. Have you ever heard of cowboy church, a cowboy church? 
You know what's funny about a cowboy church is when I was in Springfield going to Bible college, I started working on, uh, on the side at this farm right out in the middle of nowhere. And I would drive all the time and there was this property for sale and I'd pass all these farms. I even started working on the volunteer fire department out there and everything. And, uh, and I don't remember what the number was, farm road something, but there was this this road that I would always pass farm road, some, some number and this property was there. And I think there was a big barn if I remember right. And I remember thinking, you know, what would be really cool is to have like a country church they call farm road Baptist church. And so just playing around, like I, I like sketched it out and I was like drawing like these, uh, like, uh, not really bylaws, but like some kind of thing, you know, <laughs> like advertisements about this, just playing around. I'm just, I'm weird like that. And, uh, and I thought Farm Road Baptist Church, and I was like, you know, they'll meet in the barn, and they'll do like this, and I'll do like that, and you could reach all the, all the uh, farmers in that community or whatever, you know. It was just a thought that I had. And then later, years later, I found, a cowboy, found out about cowboy churches, and that's essentially what their objective is. Now, I am a little surprised because I, uh, I was under the opinion that all of them are like Pentecostal. They're not Pentecostal, but they are non-denominational. Now, some of them started with a Baptist, and I, from what I understand, even Southern Baptists kind of started some cowboy churches with their, doc, you know, theology and everything. But, uh, but anyway, so here are some rules that they have at a cowboy church. And again, I'm not, I'm not promoting this. Don't if you just like West, cowboy Western music or something. I'm not saying go uh, do a cowboy church, but. Uh, but some of their rules are like they have to meet in a non-traditional building, like a, a barn or like a metal shed type thing or something like that. They have to no dress code, right? Which is why almost all of them show up in the cowboy boots and the in the hat and all that kind of stuff, right? No dress code. Uh, they don't pass any offering plate. That's like well, these are their rules, like you know, <laughs> like no offering plate. What they do is they have like a big cowboy boot and it'll just be sitting somewhere. And anybody, if they want to give, they just go put it in the cowboy boot or a hat or something like that, right? And then it has to be non-denominational. I don't know if I already said that or not, but there's just a handful of rules that they have. And then the idea in their sermons are real short. The services are like a half hour or something like that. They feel like that's easier to reach them with that way. Anyway, I was reading about that and I thought, well, they really got their their niche, you know, their, their group that they're marketing and all that. And I'm not saying that's necessarily right. I'm just saying that that's, that's what exists out there. They know their, their, uh, their target audience, if you will. And they're going after that. Now I do remember also when I was in Springfield, uh, I've told you about this before and I don't even endorse and endorse, I don't even endorse the college that I went to out there, but they gave us these books. And you remember the whole Rick Warren purpose driven church, it's a little bit old now, but there was a day where every preacher knew about that. And uh, I still have one of those books. But uh, but I remember the thing that I, I got upset about was there was this page on there where they said, this is the, we decided you have to go. They're kind of teaching this similar idea, what I'm saying. But they said, we decided we have to go after a certain target group. And they'll say, they said, so ours, is it somewhere in California? I don't remember where they are, Saddleback, uh, whatever. But they, uh, they had this target. So they had this picture of this businessman, you know, he's like dressed business casual, you know, kind of like this, no ties, it's unbuttoned, maybe jeans or something like that. And he had this cell phone, ancient cell phone, okay, <laughs> in the picture, like when they first came out with its wearable cell phones. And uh, and the idea was like, hey, we want these businessmen, and maybe they got a family and whatever, but they we want to draw them in. And for whatever reason, that was their target audience. And I remember thinking, we just got to preach the gospel to the whole world, not have a tar not have a target, you know, and it really bothered me. Uh, but I do understand the, the idea of saying, Hey, you know, this is the group of people that we're reaching now, you know, this is, this is what they kind of honed in on who they were reaching, especially in the beginning days of a church that kind of happens sometimes. Right. So some churches will have urban church or urban ministry, but it's a, it's a church that reaches out to, uh, that crowd, like on the, in the, I guess what you call ghettos or in the downtown areas, a lot of the places that we go soul winning in. And, uh, and they'll have an urban church, but it's usually like, you know, uh, well, there's two, two different ways. Sometimes they'll have an inner city thing where, where they're dressed real casual, like hip hop, and they embrace that culture. And then you'll have the, the guys that are like the gold rings and the fancy suits and the, and the BMWs and all that kind of stuff that will kind of drive up in those neighborhoods and do a ministry. But anyway, usually uh, they're embracing that culture and, uh, 
I guess in a strange way, that is kind of that, that culture. Uh, but anyway, we have something that hits a little closer to home, old paths churches or maybe old fashioned church. And I remember thinking about this one day, like, all right, in, in, in Iola, we have an A&W, all right? Now, I hear everywhere we go, hey, we're from Iola. Hey, I drive by Iola. They have an A&W. Like, that's the one thing about, uh, about Iola that people say, hey, they got an A&W, right? So A&W has, has done a pretty good job of marketing to just the nostalgia of nostalgia of that like the 50s era and the you know the music in there uh the the what do you call that bebop or something you know uh they, that era and then the decorations and stuff you know they're pretty much targeting that that group and i remember thinking about that before like there are a lot of people that do that like we're old-fashioned you know we're uh, you know and they keep all this uh you know mem- memorabilia from the from that certain maybe hang a lot of stuff on the walls a lot of restaurants you go to and they're trying to like bring you back to this time or whatever and there's a lot of old path churches that are like that they're like hey we want to bring back this this idea of church i've heard this slogan before church as it once was you know or or church uh the way it used to be or or you know whatever and then i've, I've also heard people that despise that mark despise the way that they market that group and they've said this isn't your grandma's church <laughs> have you ever seen that like more contemporary like this isn't your grandma's church and i'm thinking well first of all like at that time, you know, early on when I became the pastor in Iola, like that's all we pretty much had were grandmas. <laughs> and so like this is your grandma's church, like literally. <laughs> all right. But what they were saying is that, hey, we're not marketing to grandma. And like even the, the Methodist church, I know they went through this thing and they got a lot of flack over it where or some of them were like getting rid of all the old people. I mean, this one church I read about, they literally said like, hey, we, it's not that we don't want you here, but why don't you come back in like a year? And we're going to start building this up with a whole new look and we're going to bring young people in. But their idea was that when we bring them in, they don't like the old fashion and the old setting. So they said, we're going to get the old people out of here. We're going to build it the way we want. And then you're welcome to come back in. You can imagine a lot of people, you know, that probably the backbone of the supporter, financial supporters and the, of that church and the ones that have been doing the work and doing all the, uh, the hard work over the years and put the sweat into it, probably built that building. <laughs> you know what I mean? All of a sudden they're told they got to leave because we, we want some new faces in here or whatever. See, that's, that's weird stuff, but I'm supposed to be talking about the positives. I'm sorry. All right. But anyway, old fashioned, old past church. Then they have, I don't know if this is an actual name, uh, something, uh, this is just what I call it, but like the celebrity church, right? This is what I'll be thinking about, like the, uh, the Lake, uh, what is it, Lakewood, Joel Osteen uh, Church, Lakewood, I think it is, uh, or the Hillsong. Hillsong is definitely, like they targeted celebrities, you know, the Justin Biebers and all those and tried to get them in there. Uh, and they would, you know, they, they try to go after that and have this like real fancy building and, and lots of money. And so here's what happens. There are, there, there's a big demographic out there of people who want to go to a rich building, fancy stuff. Everything looks nice and brand new because it makes them feel good. Right. They're in a place that makes them feel good. It's fancy, you know, and even people that it's kind of like above their, you know, pay grade, I guess you could say their class. Uh, they feel good in there. They feel like they're rich. They feel like, hey, this is a prosperous place. And so what happens, unfortunately, is a lot of people try to hit those neighborhoods. And I look, I've been in the ministry long enough and I've been in Bible college and I and I've met people who say, we're going to go hit this area. And they're talking about the areas where we hate soul winning because they're not receptive. The rich neighborhoods. We don't like going soul winning in those neighborhoods. <laughs> it's hard. You get doors slammed in your face. But you know what? If you said, hey, we, we've got this nice building we're moving into and we need people like you and you're really catering to them and you know how to speak their language, then you might be able to get them in there. And look, they got the money. That's the, that's the idea. And so to me, that's wicked. Okay. <laughs> 
And I don't like that whenever I say, hey, we're going to go to this neighborhood. We're gonna... And so here's what they'll do. They'll go like on deputation for like a couple years and, and get the money so that, hey, the pastor can have nice clothes and he can drive a nice car and he can look good whenever he goes ministering to these people. I'm not kidding about this, by the way. If you think like, well, people really do that? Yes, they do. And then they say, hey, now we're going to get all these supporting churches and say, hey, we found this building and it's a really nice building. We can get it for X amount of money. And, uh, and so we just need to raise some money. And we know that God's got us here. We know he's going to do something good. And next thing you know, people send their money. They get the big building. And look, sometimes it actually works as far as bring, filling the building up. Why? Because it's a nice building. And the advertisement, real fancy printing, and, and they put it all in the neighborhood, these big blitzes and, and all this stuff. It's not preaching the gospel. Some of those invitations don't even have the gospel on them. It's just, hey, come to our fancy building and look at this nice paperwork. Hey, haven't you been looking for a church? Uh, this is the church for you. We need people like you. I mean, that's the idea. You know, come as you are and all this kind of stuff. And, and sometimes they'll fill it up because it's the right. Maybe the preacher just knows how to talk their language. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's their niche. If they're getting people saved, I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to try to stop their ministry. It's their niche. And it's the people group that's their, that they're reaching. People get saved. We've been in some of those neighborhoods and found saved people, right? And so people get saved and, uh, and praise the Lord for that. I'm, uh, now, here, here's another one that I can't not, not talk about because this is, this is a, a big deal to me, okay? Uh, this is something that I see, and a lot of people don't realize this, but the new IFB hit a niche, right? Now, I know this, and I've talked to Pastor Anderson. He didn't intend for that to happen. Right. Pastor Anderson would just he wanted to start a church. He's preaching, put it on YouTube and all this stuff. He wasn't like, hey, I want to be that guy. You know what I mean? And just created this image for himself. He just but he found it. All right. Maybe from the being tased uh, and having that footage and all that kind of stuff or whatever, whatever the case, he landed on this niche. And he'll tell you this of truthers. All right. Yeah, everybody. How many of you guys in here like had some kind of influence because you were watching this video because you were a truther and he found out, hey, this was a huge people group, a huge demographic that we can reach of people who are looking for truth. And so he hit that and it was very successful for him. OK, and, and, he, and he ended up uh, having a huge ministry as a result of it. And I'll get the, to this at the end of the message, but yeah, hey, we are we have reaped from that uh, that labor in a lot of ways. Okay, so uh, so I'm not I'm not gonna gonna knock that. All right, but uh, then there are also just real quickly parachurch ministries, not necessarily churches and like the whole ministry, but maybe they'll have like these side ministries that are like. Uh, uh, additional ministries based out of the church, like family focused ministries or teen or children ministries, financial ministries. That's what they need in those rich churches. And so uh, teach all the people that don't know how to be, hey, you can be just like us. All you got to do is follow these principles and all this. I'm not kidding, man. That goes on. They have those classes. I've sat through some of them. And so uh, uh, recovery ministries. This is a little hits a little closer to home because I've been trying to start something in Iola that would reach out to some of these people who have been addicted uh, to different substances and alcohol and drugs and and uh, and have a hard, hard time getting off of that. And they're saved and they want to do right. Uh, but they have these. And I, I have a heart for that. I can't relate to it because I've never been down that road, but I have a heart for that. And I feel like we God's given us some people that can help minister in that area. But I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Right. And I'm not going to make something happen either. But if it's there, the opportunity comes and I can do that. I want to take advantage of the demographic that God allows me uh, to to have and our church to have. Well, let me talk real quickly about the negatives. OK, so the negatives would be. Uh, oh, OK, so hold on. So let me give you the examples from the Bible. I already talked about the fishermen. Here's another one. Look at Acts 18. Acts 18, something that until you read this, you don't really know this about Paul. Uh, you do know that 
he says a couple times, like he has the right to be paid and to live off of the gospel and to like do that full time. It's a ministry. There would be nothing wrong for him getting money. And he does. Uh, many times they send him money to support him and whatever. He, a lot of times he just distributes it to other people in need or whatever. But, uh, but he says that. But then one thing you don't realize until you read this is that he also had a side profession, right, where he made his money. Uh, so that he could live and go on these trips and do all this stuff. And the profession was a tent maker. So it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded the Jews uh, to depart from Rome, all Jews to depart from Rome. And he came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. Okay, So however it happened, he hooked up with this guy. I don't know if he led him to the Lord or if he was already a believer. I don't completely understand how that worked out. It seems almost to me like he just hooked up with this guy and maybe led him to the Lord and then began to disciple him, maybe on the job or something like that. What a great thing. I hear stories sometimes where somebody at work, you know, you lead someone to the Lord and now you're working together and you got a believer and you can kind of help them. I mean, you got to do your job first and not... <laughs> You know, not be a, a bad worker, but you've got that opportunity with people that you work. These kind of things happen. OK, now let me talk about the negatives. Number one, embracing a certain culture that the ministry sometimes will allow to trump God's word, you know, what I mean, or to trump what is is right. Hey, I think we are a little leaning more because we sing the traditional hymns and the way we dress and stuff like that. We're more traditional, a little closer to like the old past, old fashioned. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. We don't actually have a niche, I don't think, uh, yet uh, that we know what it is. At least I don't. But uh, uh, and that's fine, by the way. But um, but. You know, I think we're a little more of the old fashioned, but you know what? Sometimes even embracing just all the old fashioned ways and this is how we always done it and all that could get you into a situation where you're not following God's word. But you're just so tied to like, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we got to do it. This is our image. This is our. No, no, you got to follow God's word. Somebody could be like, hey, we're, we're reaching the inner city people. And hey, you just don't know what it's like. You know, they're not going to accept us unless we do a certain way. So we have to become like them. So let's get the piercings and the tats and all this kind of stuff and, and dress this way because you got to be like them to be able to reach them. Well, that's not necessarily biblical either, right? And so, you know, you can't just start throwing all your convictions and, and uh, your, your stands on what God's word says. Uh, you just throw that out the window so that you can reach a certain people group. I don't believe Paul did that. Oh, but he said he was all things to all men. Really? So you think Paul just, you know, <laughs> jumped in? I mean, you know, he did go into the uh, synagogue. But uh, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think he just went into any culture and just started doing all the things that they do. No, he stood up for truth and said, well, this is what the Bible says. And he stood out in many of those places and was separated from them. Well, he became all things to all people. You know, the context there was just that he was willing to put aside some of his, his, uh, his cultural things, you know, that weren't biblical, that weren't important to be able to reach these people. He didn't hold on to those, you know, and, uh, and have to have it his way. To be, you know, he, he let go of all that. Hey, you don't, I mean, to the point like, hey, you don't want to eat meat? I won't eat meat. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and that's not like a biblical thing. Like, there's nothing in the Bible says that you have to eat meat or else you're sinning. All right? Now, he ate meat, but just not whenever he was around those people that didn't eat meat. And so, uh, and so the, it's not saying that he just like became whatever. And uh, so, okay, let me give you a good example. This is the worst example, unfortunately, that I can think about, but it's, it's true. You know, there are people that their whole ministry is geared towards reaching the LGBT community. I remember sitting down one time with a pastor that was telling me he was reading this book and he was talking about this guy who landed himself in some kind of a uh, of an area where there was a lot of uh, transvestites walking up and down the streets and stuff like that. And he was like, over some time, he ended up reaching these people. And so now his whole ministry is like all these people who have been like converted and they're sitting here. And this guy was like, isn't that wonderful? And I was like, well, let me just say this, <laughs> all right? And so I told him what I, what I feel about that. <clears throat> Tune in to Sunday night's messages in Iola this month. And we're going to have uh, some interesting sermons. Okay, so uh, uh, anyway, so what, 
we're just going to go just reach this crowd that God said is an abomination and, you know, like, just be so low. Like, it gets really, really bad. Now, obviously, we're not that way, uh, but, you know, like the Methodist church, I mean, they just totally just embraced it. And, hey, we got to love them. And to the next thing you know, they got lesbian pastors, you know, up there preaching. And and uh, and they just, it's just crazy. It's crazy. Oh, we, we live in a crazy world. And it gets really obvious in the month of June. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but there are people that actually will target them specifically, you know, and say like, all right, we need to go out and we need to reach these people. People group. That sounds kind of like the Army's tactics, doesn't it? <laughs> We need to reach these people group. Why? Why? <laughs> I mean, why don't you just preach the gospel to everybody? Look, I preached just the other day. I preached to a guy who who was self-admittedly to be homosexual. He'd be like, why did you do that? I was at his door and I got the gospel in my hand. I preached the gospel. He rejected it because he's hard in his heart and he's turned over to a rubber in mind. But I tried. <clears throat> and uh, and so, look, I don't, I'm not against preaching the gospel. I preach the gospel to everybody. Right. But I'm not going to go base my ministry off of something, you know, like that. And so that's just a that's just a that's like the worst example I can think about in, in that way. But I've there are people that do that ministries that do that. Uh, also, uh, the people that will turn over to the hip hop culture and the music and the, the hey, it's got Christian words, though. You know what I mean? But it's just like straight. It sounds like, uh, you know, I, man, I would never want someone to think that I listen to that kind of music. Because there's nothing that comes good out of that 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 culture, right? It has nothing to do with race or anything like that. It's just a it's just a, a hip hop culture that's wicked. Right. Or here's some, some ministries of this just covetousness. You know, I've already hit on that a little bit. But some of these churches, mega churches, and all that, and hey, you know, these uh, uh, I can't think word of faith ministries or whatever, like prosperity gospel. You know, what they're doing is they're embracing this culture of covetousness. We want to have lots of stuff, and so God's going to give it to us. And look, I don't think that we would ever go that direction, but you know, it could happen. You get in a rich neighborhood, and you got to fit this certain part, and so you start going after the nice things, you know, uh, uh, all because you think that that's what's going to be best for your ministry, and you could get to a point where you're doing something wicked instead of following the Bible and just saying, you know, we're going to do what's right, and, uh, and, you know, let God kind of give us that niche and show us what that niche is. And uh, because ultimately we are going, you are going to have some sort of niche. If you're going to be effective, you have to learn what that is and embrace that. I do believe uh, that there is a time and a place for that. But we know that ultimately we're going to go after, you know, whosoever will. All right. So uh, it could be also easy to look at other groups that aren't in your niche, right? And say, hey, well, those are people that wouldn't fit in. Those are people that wouldn't belong like us. Look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and did eat with them. <gasps> <laughs> right? What they were saying is, hey, hey, why are you going after that group? That's not the Jews, right? You know, that, that's not your people group. And if you if you get too involved in your niche, then all of a sudden, like you're just you built you put yourself in a box and you're just like, hey, I'm not gonna reach it. In fact, you become enemies with the people over there because they're that niche isn't our niche, and it's like, whoa, man, you've missed the whole message of the gospel and about Christianity. Right? It's not about just, uh, hey, we're going to find our niche and nobody else can. If they're not like us, then they don't, they're not right with God. And they're not. That's not what it is about. Amen. These different groups, they start dividing from each other. First Corinthians three. First Corinthians three and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but unto, as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For as whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not yet? Are ye not carnal? 
Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by which he believe. Even as the Lord gave uh, to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Right? Man, however you got saved, praise the Lord. You fit in that group and you stay in that group and that group is different than my group. Well, praise the Lord. You know what I mean? I'm not going to try to stop anybody from, from trying to grow in the Lord. Uh, yeah, that's not my calling. I need to, I need to worry about my, my people, but at the same time, we're going to keep giving the gospel to everybody. We're going to, if that, you know, if we can work with some of those churches that aren't necessarily just exactly like us, we'll work with them. You know, if we can't, if there's too many differences going a different direction, we won't, but we don't necessarily have to try to destroy their ministry either. You know? And so we got to be careful about that. Okay, so let's talk about our church. Obviously, we want to reach anyone we can, and we invite just about anybody, not, not everybody, but we invite just about anybody to join our cause. Uh, but do we have a niche? Do we have a niche? Well, first of all, I can say this, and I don't, I'm, I, don't re, I don't hold back from saying this because it's very true especially primarily here in Kansas City, but also in Iola, I, as the pastor, I've tapped into the new IFB. Do you know what I mean? I've tapped into it. Now, I've said from day one, I'm not new IFB. I'm not, that's not my niche. I'm not like, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not all in. Does that make sense? And the reason why, because I said from day one, like I, I know where that leads. When you just jump into it, you isolate yourself and you put yourself in a certain group, you know, now you're going to have, you know, hey, that's the new IFB, but this is the new, new IFB. <laughs> and, the, and this is the, the uh, re recovering new IFBs. And this is the, ah, you see what I'm saying? Now, hey, what do I mean by I've tapped into the new IFB? There are some things that came out, and out of that movement, if you will, that I embrace wholeheartedly. Things that are very important that I find in here. And I'm like, you know what? That's right. And so I'm going to preach it. And I've got guys that I fellowship that are hardcore new IFB, you know, and I've got guys that hate the new IFB who I'm friends with. It is possible to be friends with both, by the way, <laughs> right? It is like I, I mean, if the drama starts happening, I'm like, hey, that's y'all's drama. That's not my drama. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, I'm just serving the Lord and we can sharpen iron and we can be buddies, you know, and help each other. Or I can just stand out of the way and let you guys fight. Not me. That's not me. I'm not in. I'm not into that. I'm not new IFB. I'm not. I'm not old IFB. I'm not the new new IFB or anti new IFB. <laughs> I'm an independent Baptist. <laughs> I'm independent, right? Whatever this church, whatever happens, and I'm not trying to start a club or a denomination or anything like that. But whatever happens in this church, right? We don't have to like line up 100% with another group. And look, most people, by the way, in the new IFB, they don't believe that. They, they believe that they're just independent Baptist churches as well. But, but there are some who've been kind of, uh, who have become this kind of group uh, that's, that's a little bit, hey, again, I, I praise the Lord for those influences that have helped me be who I am today. I praise the Lord for the guys in this room that are the fruit of, man, I heard somebody say, and this offended me. Someone said, what good fruit has ever come out of the new IFB? I was like, well, let me take you to Kansas City one day, Kansas City Mission, let's take our work. And I think there's a lot of fruit here. You're like, oh, this is not your fruit. No, it's not my fruit. And you know what? It's not Pastor Anderson's fruit either. <laughs> he planted, I'm watering. <laughs> God gives the increase, right? Uh, you know, it's not me. It's not my work. It's not anyway. We're just trying to follow the Lord and do what's right as an independent Baptist church. Amen. Careful who you share that with online. <laughs> Start some drama from either from either side. Next week I'm preaching. Next, uh, well, let's see. Yeah, next Sunday afternoon here, I'm preaching. There's a, a two, two. Uh, I'm sorry, a ditch on both sides, ditch on both sides, and that, and that's. A, I ho hope that ends up being what I see that to be. That's a very important message. All right, so I have tapped into the new IFB early on. People were like, "So are you new IFB?" And I'm like, "Well, I mean, I guess you could say I'm new IFB compatible." <laughs> You know, you got Lego over here, and then you got generic Lego over here. We fit. <laughs> but I'm not, you don't have to stamp no label on me. 
Hey, how you know we're not the name brand? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Braden's offended. I am not a generic Lego. <laughs> Naturally, we all have friends and family, and we try to reach them. And praise the Lord, we've seen people come in, people bring their family, whatever. Look, there's different trades, there's different jobs, there's different hobbies, different interests. We don't really know where that's going to go, you know. Uh, I started uh, I started the, the potluck events, not trying to, and it's not even a ministry, like I just did it for fun. And uh, some of the church, some churches caught on and said, hey, let's do this potluck event, and hey, we'll join you. But here's what I found. If you're trying to build a big church, that's not the niche to go after. <laughs> There's not very many people out there that want to do that kind of stuff, all right? <clears throat> but I still do it, and it's fun. I just do, I don't do it because I'm trying to build some kind of thing. I just do it, and you know, if we hit happen to hit some uh, uh, friends and, and and get some some people interested in that, meet some folks, praise the Lord. I don't think it's probably going to happen. What 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 are our niches? We like coffee around here, but I'm not going to be a coffee house church. I don't like the way those go. <laughs> You ever go to a coffee shop? It's like, I love coffee, but I don't want to hang around the coffee shop. There's too many weirdos. <laughs> we're not going to be a coffee uh, coffee shop church. But we're going to keep serving coffee, though. <laughs> Some of us like outdoor stuff, camping, hiking, right? I don't know if anything ever come of that. I'm not going to try to make it come out of that. But you know what? If we were able to reach people, Brother Justin, got, uh, Brother Justin led somebody to the Lord while camping the other day. And so, you know, it could, it could happen, you know. We'll start a, an Appalachian Trail ministry. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Now. So here's, here's my point. Is we don't need to make things happen, right? We need to just obey the Lord, go preach the gospel, try to be true to, true to His Word the best that we know how, right? But along the way, we are going to find some areas of kind of niches, right? And there's no reason to, that we can't embrace that. And be like, hey, this is this is what we are. Look, we we when I said we tapped we tapped into that. Look, I'm not being deceitful. I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. I, I, I you you ask me what I believe. I'll tell you what I believe. I've said that to everybody. Old IFB people that don't want anything to do with me now because I'm too close to the to the to the new IFB. I'll say the same thing to them. Talk to me. I'll tell you what I believe. You know, but I'm an independent Baptist. You know, but you say, oh, but you got stuff on the shelves over here. You got documentaries and stuff like that from. Yeah, because I believe that they're good stuff. And I would share them with people or whatever. And so if people call up and say, you know, hey, I've been looking for a good church. You know, and Pastor Anderson said that you have a good church. What am I, you know, well, praise the Lord. What do you, you know, here's what we believe. I'll tell you what we believe. You know, if it lines up good enough for you, <laughs> well, then come on down. If it doesn't, hey, you got two choices. You can either come check us out and just like, hey, it's close enough. Or you can say, nope, not enough for me, and go somewhere else. It doesn't matter because we're doing our own thing. And so, uh, uh, so, but praise the Lord, we've got a lot of visitors, and we've made a lot of friends, and we love the soul winning events, and we go in, we hang out with a lot of people who we've met, who are like-minded, who win souls, praise the Lord, and, uh, and we have great fellowship. What? Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. You don't have to stamp a label on me, though. We don't need to make it happen, but when we find a niche, I don't necessarily think that we have a, a, a niche personally. Okay, but if it happens and we find that, we need to em embrace it. And we might find, because again, going back to the whole new IFB thing, uh, Pastor Anderson said that he never intended to get the type of people and the type of ministry that he has now. Okay, and uh, and so... You know, that's the that's the same thing. I think it was taking like 10 years or something like that before he started seeing that that huge growth. So some so like somebody in our church, uh, uh, an old an older lady, but somebody who also used to listen to uh, Pastor Anderson a lot. And uh, and she said, you know, I watch this and I and I see like he got a congregation of 300. And she mentioned a few other pastors and they got these big congregations. And it's like, what do they do differently? And I'm like, well, go talk to him. It took him like 10 years to get there. <laughs> you know, be patient and just keep serving the Lord and don't worry about the numbers. Right. But when you can reach more people, go reach them. And so uh, I, hope that makes, I hope that makes sense. We just need to be obedient to the gospel and, uh, 
and help and not hinder other ministries that are preaching the same gospel. I, I mentioned earlier about somebody who, because uh, I got off on the little numbers thing about the 153 fish, uh, somebody who got bitter because they left the, you know, they were heavily involved in the new IFB and then they left because people didn't treat them right and some things happened. Look, I warned this person, by the way, uh, the way you're going about handling this is just going to cause you to be bitter and negative and all that stuff. And it did. And so now he's like totally anti new IFB. Nobody in the new IFB is even saved and, and their soul went in the wrong way and all this kind of stuff. And I was just like, what in the world? <laughs> And he's like, I think what you need to do is make a clean break from them and you need to do this. I'm like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it because I don't see any reason to. I was never saying that I was something different than what I am right now. <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm happy to be who we are as a church. Right? I'm happy to be uh, your pastor and I'm happy uh, to see the things happening that are happening here. Let's just keep it up and let's just not put God in a box, you know. All right, Lord, Lord, we thank you for this church. It's your church. I thank you for great men of God from the old IFB, new IFB, uh, and even some people in, in neither of those camps who have contributed and influenced me and different people in this church. And, and even talking earlier about how some, uh, some negative influences in some of us have, uh, have helped us to, uh, to study and to become uh, who we are today. And I thank you for all of that, Lord. I thank you for building your church. You said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. And so we, we give you that uh, responsibility, Lord, and we wait for you to build your church. I believe you are building your church and I pray that you just help us be faithful instruments and vessels uh, that will allow you to do that the way you want to. I pray you help this church be effective continue to win souls, continue to teach the Bible, and uh, that you be pleased by it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.